Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? Um, this morning we're going to cover Romans 12, 1 through 8. And I want to cover this specifically because I, actually there's a video that Derek prints an excerpt from one of his sermons that leans into this too, and I'll share it in the uh, description. Um, do you remember the video I did a while back talking about you were saved where you are for a reason? where you were saved, what you were involved in, what you were doing, you were saved there in that place for a reason. That God has a purpose for why he saved you where you were. And he will give you a ministry according to that. And we all have some form of ministry. And we're going to read that here in Romans 12. But we were, it, there's a purpose behind that. And it's because we're uniquely qualified in the environment that we're in to relate to other people in that same environment. Now, some people uh, get pulled into other things that uh, pull them out of their area. God has a different plan for them. But for each one of us, there's a plan. He uses us where we are. Because we get these ideas in our head and people tell us sometimes, many times, you have to change. You have to go do this. You have to go do that. That may not be what God wants for you. And he gives the gifts according to those things. And so we get this in our we get this thing in our life, and I've done this. I still do this sometimes. I should have done more. Oh, excuse me. In fact, just the other day I was praying, you know, Lord, I wish I hadn't wasted the last twenty years. I wish I hadn't wasted wasted the the ten years before that. I wish I hadn't wasted the ten years before that. I could have done so much more. And before I used to feel guilty, but now I know because I realized he knew what he was doing and he did it that way on purpose. Because everything that I've done in the last 20 years, and even before that, but mainly in the last 20 years, has put me in the position that I'm in to make me uniquely qualified to do what I'm doing. To give me a, a, a mental perspective. Because if I'd have, if I'd have tried to do this five five years ago, if I'd have tried to do this ten years ago, um, fifteen years ago, there's no way. Couldn't have done it. I wasn't in the right frame of mind. I wasn't. I didn't know the things that I know now. I didn't have the perspective that I had even just five years ago. I didn't have the right perspective to be able to do this. <coughs> He had to change my perspective. And I've told you guys the story. It was December of 2018. And I was getting back into that place again that I didn't want to be in. And I was back, I was at the bottom. And I'm just laying there. And I'm looking at my phone. What video am I going to watch next? And I was watching just random junk. Mainly, mainly geared one direction, but it had nothing to do with God. And out of the blue, a video popped up in my feed. I never watched that stuff before. I watched that one video. And that video had nothing to do with religion either. It had to do with the planet Saturn. But there was something that something that was just, that sparked in me. And then he he grabbed me by the chest, standing beside the bed, and shook me back and forth and said, Wake up. I'm coming. It wasn't an audible tone. It was inside. Wake up, I'm coming. And it was violent to the point that I looked over to my wife because I thought she would wake up. And instantly everything changed. Then my feed on my, my video feed, and you guys know your video feed is associated with what you watch. My video feed was full of sermons. I hadn't watched one. My whole He changed my video feed on my YouTube channel. And I knew that I was being led a different direction. That was the time I had finally gotten where he, he, he wanted me. And then he made the change. And why didn't he call me, you know, back in 2012? When other people were waking up. Why not 2014? Why not 2017? When other people were waking up to the signs. That wasn't when he needed me. That wasn't when he wanted me. I wasn't ready. When I was ready, he changed me. 
and it has been a roller coaster ever since, and I love it. First, 2019, he changed my understanding on things that I was mis uh, had been misled on. <coughs> 2020, he separated me out from everybody. And now here we are in 2021, pushing forward to that finish line. Excuse me, my sinuses are in horrible shape this morning. He's doing the same with everyone else. Some of y'all have been with me since 2019. You've been walking this journey with me. You've seen, you've been part of the change. You've changed too. He's leading all of us. That's what he does. That's how he works. Tell me since 2019 how much your life has changed. How your view of things has changed. How your view of yourself has changed. And I can tell you my view of myself is far different. Not looking at myself as being something special, but looking at myself as how I ought to. And we, we're going to see this in Romans 12. And each one of us has something particular about us, about our personality that makes us very unique to deal with particular people. That's why we're not led to a lot of people. And some people, they just, it's like a grocery store when they're going to people for salvation. That may be what they're good for. They may be setting people up. Because, you know, sometimes he'll save them and then it'll kind of go quiet for a while. And then he'll bring them up when the time is right. Some people... We may only go to one person, but you know what? One person is all we need to go to because the rest of the time we're helping others. God knows what he's doing. He has it set up this way for a reason. His grace and mercy cover us. He justifies us. Christ is our advocate. <coughs> and he teaches us and trains us and sanctifies us. Helps us to grow to be a vessel of honor. And not everybody accepts that. Many people run away from it. They start to get that feeling and it terrifies them and because they don't want to come out of the life they're in. <clears throat> so it, it's, it's important to read the Bible to understand what the Word of God is saying towards us as individual people, not as a group. Far too often we... we it's talking to the Jews as a group, which most of the time it is. But then we get to the New Testament and we don't realize that much of the scripture in the New Testament is speaking to the individual reader. And this is a concept that some people have presented, but not many have. Because they always use we, us, the church, in relation to these scriptures, and that's fine. But I've been given a different view on this. One of the things that I've been good at is to take things and make them relatable to real life. And so I use that a lot in my, in my videos. When he's speaking to us in the New Testament, and you read it, don't read it as if he's speaking to someone else. Read it as if he's speaking directly to you. And watch how quick things change. Because then the angle that you're looking at it is changes. Most of us, when we read the Bible, we read it as somebody on the outside. But to those who are saved and have realized it's speaking directly to them, when they read the Bible, they're within the words of the Bible. It's wrapped around them. They're a part of it. Because it, 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 is, it is life. It is the bread of life. It means something. And it speaks directly to our heart. And the Holy Spirit will convict us concerning those things. When you come to that place of reading, it is astounding what you discover. Not only about yourself. Oh, excuse me. But about the world around you. The people, the other people in your life. And if you stay with it, if you lay it all out on the table for the Lord, if you come to a place where you submit and say, Lord, I'm yours. Tell me what you want me to do. It changes your heart. And you learn to love everyone. And you learn to not 
and not sweat things or worry about things. Are you going to have sadness? Absolutely. That's a having a heart of compassion. Are you going to shed tears? Absolutely. Are you going to feel alone? Feel abandoned? Are you going to feel by yourself? Absolutely. You can stand in a whole, you can go to a family reunion and be there with 300 people and still feel like you're alone because you're the only person there that knows God the way you do. Even going to church, I go to church and feel like I'm different. I feel like I'm set apart from everyone else. And that's not trying to be high-minded. It's just that most people are in a church to get their feel-good for the week. And then they get their infusion. And then they go on about their week. And by the end of the week, they're ready for another infusion. But for, people, for, for those of us who have gone all in, to use a gambling term. It's it's literal life. That's why I tell you, don't just pray Ephesians 6. Live it. Live that armor. Your life changes. Your life gets so quiet and peaceful to the point that it's boring. You know, I love boring. I love boring. I love when it's boring because it's quiet. <laughs> there's, there's no stress. And I, I'm... My doctor has told me I have to keep stress out of my life. So the Lord has really had a lot of mercy on me concerning that. But at the same time, I don't run and hide from stress. I deal with it. Most cases, I deal with it very abruptly and very direct and to the point. Now that, that excerpt from Derek Prince's uh, sermon, it's about I think it's like eight minutes long. Uh, he talks about the same thing in there. It's worth listening to after this video. Go down to the description. It'll be at the top of the description. <coughs> he talks about exactly what I'm about to talk about from the same scriptures. And I've talked about this before with you guys. So let's go through and read Romans 12. It's only the first eight verses. And it, it's talking about leading living sacrifices to God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now stop right there. That first verse, powerful stuff. Present your body as a living sacrifice. What is that? You deny yourself. I'm going to deny myself watching those movies I used to watch because they open the door to, to, to demons. I'm going to deny myself the, uh, the pleasures that I used to give myself because they don't accord with God's will. Like pornography, masturbation, drug use, alcohol abuse, I'm going to deny myself those things. I'm going to deny myself those lusts that I satisfy because that doesn't accord with God's will. I read his word. That's what it says. I'm going to look at the other things in my life. You know what? I need to get this out of my life because I just don't need it. I've got a big red motorcycle out there and it's about to get sold because I just don't need it. I'm going to eliminate things in my life. Now, do I still enjoy things? Yeah, i got a quad out there and I enjoy using that. I work with it sometimes. But I just don't need it. So I take a lot of the things I don't need in my life and I eliminate them. If I'm able to sell it, give the money to the, to the local soup kitchen or the Christian cupboard. You know, my view of those things has changed. I want to do God's will. I want to listen to his word and obey it. And it's a journey. It's a it's a walk that you take. Some liken it to the walk of the through the valley of the shadow of death. And what happens when you do those things? People don't want to be around you no more. People will stop talking to you. Or they'll just come around every now and then. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians, will change because of that. Well, Jesus made an interesting statement. He said. In order to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross. You have to hate your life. Because he who loses his life will find it, and he who finds his life will lose it. So, while I love all those people, I, I let it go. I just stand back and just let it happen. Because if it goes, it goes. Because I want the Lord over that. I want the Lord over them. 
he's more important to me. He's the most, the most important thing because my relationship with him will play over onto them. Blessings will pour out onto them because of it. And according to the Bible, sanctification pours over onto them because of it. I'm witnessing this happening in my wife right now. I'm witnessing changes in several people around me right now. That's the sanctification process. Happening to them, the Lord is good. Part of you changing to accord with God's will in your life, presenting your body as a living sacrifice, has an effect on the people directly around you. It's a good thing. Now he goes on, holy, so we know what holiness is. We look in the Bible, it tells us what it is. It's getting rid of those, those things in your life. There's as much of that sin as you can. It, remove. You're not going to conquer it completely. You can't. It's impossible. But you remove the temptations. If there's something in your life that's a temptation to something you know doesn't make God happy, remove the temptation. That makes it easier for you to fight the sin. And then you become acceptable to God. And then he concludes this verse with, which is your reasonable service. It's the least you can do. At, you know, considering what God did for you, I consider what God did for me. He didn't have to call me. He could have called someone else. He called me. He's saving me. The least I can do to repay that. Because I can never say thank, thank you enough. <clears throat> I can never show my thanks enough. I can never serve him properly. I can never be sinless. I can never achieve <clears throat> by myself what it would take to be in his good graces fully. It is only through Jesus Christ that I'm able to attain those things because it is the things he has attained already. Now that I know this, absolutely I want to serve God as much as I can. I want to do the things that are going to make him happy including cleaning up my life and getting rid of the things I know I don't need. And that's a walk all of us eventually take. But it's, this is a reasonable service. It's for us to look at our lives and go, what can I eliminate? What in my life doesn't make God happy? And that's what I need to try to get rid of. And you do the best you can and he will strengthen you through those things. I know he's doing it to me every day. I wake up some mornings, I still have PTSD, I wake up some mornings with some of the most horrible thoughts, as soon as I'm aware of, of being awake, I, horrible thoughts, and it's a battle to get rid of them, but as I wake up, I get stronger and stronger to fight, fight them off. That's the corruption that's in my flesh. Those are the things that remind me to stay humble, remind me of who I am and what I am. And where my salvation comes from. So it's it's technically a good thing. What's the matter? I gotta go potty. Both bathrooms are full. Okay, hold on just a second. No, just a second, guys. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that, guys. My wife needed to use the bathroom. But you know what? Perfect example. How uh, everything happens for a reason. That never happens. This is the first time I've, since I've been using our little water closet back here, our toilet closet back here, as my video thing because it's too much noise in the mornings in the other room. And that's the first time my wife's ever had to come ask me to get out of here so, I sh so she could use the bathroom because our other bathroom was occupied. It was for a reason. I was out of water. I've been having a hard time lately. I'm uh, um, coughing up some stuff and my throat's been really dry. And uh, I wasn't going to go get any more water. So the Lord made me stop. <laughs> I go get some more water. It seems like something insignificant, but it actually has a big meaning. Because if I hadn't have done it, I'd have been coughing through most of it. I see him everywhere now. I mean, it may sound weird to some people, but I see him everywhere. Okay, so let's continue with these eight verses. Verse 2, Paul goes on to say, And do not be conformed to this world. There is change that's going to happen. Before we're saved, we're conformed to this world. We do the things according to the way this world wants us to do them. After we're saved, things start to change. We start to see things for what they are. We start to see things 
you know what? That's not something I should be involved in. I need to get away from that. And we start to become more conformed with God's will. He goes on in that sentence to say, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So as your mind changes, as your understanding grows, as your sanctification progresses, you start to see the things, and this is why it's so important to read the Bible. You start to see those things in his word that talk about the things in your life that don't need to be there. And you start to see, you're like, that's something I need to get rid of. You start to realize that the will he has for my life is different than what I'm doing now. And his will is that these things need to be gotten rid of. Now, the great thing about us being able to counsel each other is people who have already gone through those things are very uniquely qualified to help you get out of those things, to give you advice. Like getting, they never tell you, almost no one ever tells you, you go to them, I got this sin, I can't get rid of this sin. Okay, what in your life right now is causing temptation for those things? Get rid of that. I had a guy come to me say he was, this was uh, early 2020. He goes, I'm, I'm, I'm saved, but I can't get away from the marijuana. I, I don't know. I, I fight it and it gets worse. I told him, what in your life right now is a temptation? So this is what God showed me. I get rid of the temptation. There's, it's much less of a problem. Just the act of getting rid of the temptation shows what you want. And you may not conquer the sin, but you definitely make pro progression towards more towards God's will for you. And I told him, whatever you find in your life is a temptation. Get rid of it. And he said, you mean everything? And I said, yes, everything. And I already knew, and it hit me what he was thinking of. I already knew what he was going to ask. I said, yes, everything, including friends. And he responded back, I don't know how you knew I was going to say that. I said, well, that's because that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's talking between us. Me and you are talking, but the Holy Spirit between us is conversing too. I said, you, you may have to change your life completely to get if you want to get control over this. But your friends are going to goad you into doing it. Let me, let, me, let me guess. Your friends are out there going, come on, man. A little bit won't hurt. And then you get into a big smoke session with them. Posters on your wall. Magazines. Paraphernalia. The smell, I said, you need to clean your whole house. And I told him, I said, if it gets too bad and it's still eating you up and you can't get this under control, at least to some degree, I said, I said you may have to move. You may have to make a major life change. And people do it all the time. Now, that's one of the extreme cases. But it happens. There are prostitutes today that get saved. <clears throat> some of them stay connected with the girls that they're friends with and they preach to them and they minister to them some of them it's such a struggle because they're hooked in that market that they go to another country move anywhere to get away from it because it's so hard for them to get out from under that stuff but these are extreme examples. Some of us, it's much, it's much easier. You know, people that have, are having struggles with alcohol. Well, first of all, you clean the house out and ask the people around you, "Hey, I, please, please don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want the temptation." So you avoid it. You don't go near the beer coolers and the stores and stuff like that. You stay away from that temptation until you're able to get control of yourself. Some people, it's much more. But for each of us, it's different. But the fact that the conviction hits you that you need to quit doing that tells you the Holy Spirit is working in you. Hey, this is a distraction from the Lord. Abandon this. Go to Him. Show Him that you love Him more. I show Him that I love Him more by giving up the things I know I don't need to be involved in. I choose God over this. So He's saying in verse 2, the renewing of your mind is going to show you where you need to walk. Don't conform to this world and ignore that renewal. Don't re ignore the Holy Spirit. Listen to it. 
because then you'll be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Verse 3, for I say through the grace given to me. Now, remember who Paul is and what he went through. He was killing Christians and Jews, putting them in prison, hunting them down, kicking doors in. I mean, he was like a one-man SWAT team. They were, he was taking them out. He had a bloodlust because he was there when Stephen was stoned. The Bible mentions him specifically. Because they all laid their coats at his feet for him to watch while they went over there and uh, killed Stephen. He watched it. He had a bloodlust. And God saved him. Christ went to him and saved him. So Paul has a very, very unique picture and understanding of what's going on. And he understands the grace that was shown to him because uh, the, one of the highest levels of grace was shown to him. <clears throat> that was for a reason too. For I say, Paul is a perfect picture of somebody who is on the exact opposite side of what God would, would deem a, a savable person and yet Christ saved him. So it shows you that anybody can be saved, even you. I know the feelings some of us have. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you. Saying, here, listen to me. This is what was shown to me. I know I have experience in this. To all of you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. He's telling them, look, I do this too. Pay attention to me and the position that I used to have and look at where I'm at now. I can tell you from personal experience, be careful how you think of yourself. Watch how much, how high you think of yourself. You know, people get on their high horse. I'm a next, to, next in line to be a perfect Christian and none of you are worthy to talk to me. No. The perfect Christians... The near to perfect Christians are down there where everybody else is. The ones up on the high horses need to be knocked off so they can get saved. Because it's real easy for somebody to step up to the door, not cross the threshold, but elevate themselves up to godlike status. And that's what we see happening today. That's why you have people running around calling themselves apostles today. There are no apostles. It's impossible for anybody to be an apostle. You had to have seen the risen Christ. Jesus made a special appearance for Paul. So he would have seen him risen. He got to see him bodily. Everyone else Jesus appeared to and he ascended. He never presented himself to anyone else. There are no modern day apostles. Yet that's what people are doing. There's people out there calling themselves prophets. Look, we all have the spirit of prophecy within us. There are no modern day prophets. There's no need for them. We have the complete word of God, whereas they didn't have it before. There's no need for a modern day prophet. Yet people are elevating themselves up to some status that is not theirs. It was never given to them. Be sober minded. Focus on the thing, things that God wants for your life. And do what you can to fulfill that will that he has for you. It's not works for salvation. It's works because of salvation. See, we get these weird ideas in our head about what good works are. And we don't realize good works start right here. Right in front of us. In our lives. Getting rid of those temptations is a good work. Giving thanks and prayer is a good work. Calling out to God is a good work. Um, worship. It's all a good, those are all good works. Praying for others, good work. Intercessory prayer, good works. Those, those are really good works, and they're good spiritual works. And then we have the physical works. Now, the physical works don't hold no value, depending on whether the Spirit is behind them or not. The physical work means nothing. It's the Spirit behind it that makes the difference. So we have to stop and look at these things more closely. We have to stop and think about these things and whether we're elevating ourselves up to a level we shouldn't be. The person that drops a check in the offering plate once a month for $10,000 is giving less 
than the person who drops in the 875 they had in their pocket and that's all they had left out of their paycheck. Because that person gave it because they had love for the Lord. I love the Lord. I want this church to do better. I, I want to I wanna give. Because I love him. Because he saved me. And Jesus gave that example in the Bible. So we have to be sober minded. We have to keep it down to earth. I am nothing. I'll, I'll lay myself out. Out there. I'm nothing. What I do here is nothing. Especially, as Paul says in Romans, if I don't do it with love, it's nothing. It is God that is everything. It is Christ that must be magnified. I must, like John the Baptist said it right, I must decrease, he must increase. I am nothing. This word that I'm preaching, that's where the value is. God that gave us this word, that's where the value is. Jesus Christ who offered himself as a sacrifice for us, that's where the power and the sacrifice is. That's where the authority is, not me. That's why I make sure to reiterate to you guys over and over again, stop listening to YouTube preachers, including me, and read your Bible because God is speaking to you through the Bible. He makes mentions to you through some of the stuff that I share and others share. But he's speaking to you through this word. He wants you down here in this word where he can work with you. See, the Bible, when you're, at, you're in the Bible, you're in the classroom. If you're listening to my video or somebody else's video, you're just hearing the, the advertisement. But the Bible, that's the classroom. And if you go there and ask him in prayer to show you his truth so that you will know what the truth is, so that you can walk more circumspectly with his will, and you got the right thing in your heart for that, the right desire... He will do it. I know he will. It did it for me. Many other people have this same testimony. Now, at the end of verse 3, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You think, you, But to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So each one of us is a little different. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. The hand doesn't wear a shoe and walk on the ground like a foot. Every body part has a different function. Verse 5, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. This is allegory. And this is, this is representation. And individually members of one of another of one another we operate individually yet we support each other having then verse 6 gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us let us use them so we look at what we've been given and we work within that realm we don't lust after somebody else's gift we don't pray and say you know what i don't want these gifts i want this gift we don't know you don't know what god's trying to do with you and how he's using you because your gift was given to you for a reason and it may be your gift is music. You're playing the organ or you're playing something in the, in the church. That's your gift. That's your ministry. You do your ministry through that. And maybe you can relate things more to real life. That's your ministry. It may be that you can decipher certain um, meanings that are in the scriptures. That's your gift. That's what you work in. It may be you're really good with the Greek and Hebrew. That's your gift. That's what you do. It may be that he, he tells you here about giving. He continues in verse 6, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Don't make stuff up. Don't do things that are going to dishonor God, like many people have been doing. Many, many, many people, because they're so desperate to be important. They're so desperate to be loved. They want views. They want to get that ad revenue. So they're making stuff up. Don't do that. That's bad. Or ministry. Let us use it. In our ministry. He who teaches in teaching. See, not everybody's a teacher. Only some people have been given that. Verse 8, he who exhorts. That's building up an exhortation, building people up. That's a ministry. Some of y'all have a, a great exhortation ministry. You go through the comment sections and exhort everybody. He who gives with liberality. Some people have a giving ministry. I've met one. Sister in Christ uh, 2019, 2020. Uh, donated to my ministry. I split it up and donated it out. It was great. I don't have that ministry. He who leads with diligence. Some people are leaders. 
maybe not leader in a church, but they're leader in other things. That's your ministry. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. That's a ministry. Think about that. You're a person who shows mercy to other people when other people around them don't show mercy to them. That's your ministry. If the pastors of the church in this country, in this world, would take the time to interview their church members, would look and listen and use discernment and pay attention to what they do in their everyday lives and look for those and see those different ministries and go, I'm going to put that person on my team. I'm going to put that person on my team. I'm going to put that person on my team. These are the people that make up the body of Christ. And those different ministries will make a church that would be conquer every church because the people that are uniquely qualified and trained by God and given the gifts and faith by God to work in that particular ministry are the people running those parts of your church. But instead, we just find somebody we like and throw them in the job. That's not the perfect person for that. There are people that are amazing at prayer. I'm not amazing at it. There are people that are amazing at prayer. The words flow out of them. Those, that, those people are your prayer team. That's their ministry. You need to have them praying for everybody. You need to have prayer meetings focused on that. Those are the ones who lead people in prayer. There's a leading ministry and there's a prayer ministry. But you, if you ne some people, they're really, really good with finances. Those are the people that do the finance ministry. They do the giving ministry. You have to identify who's good at what. Now, some of us have multiple ministries, and we combine them together and use them to help. Many people who do videos on YouTube have multiple ministries. They're not particularly super good at one, but they have multiples that work together well. That's all according to God. That's what Paul's talking about here. If this is what you've been given, this is what you operate in. What happens is you stay humble. You realize that I have to lean on other people for the other things. We learn to come together and bless each other. We learn to come together and be a blessing to each other. The hand helps the other hand. The foot leads the other foot. The knees bend perfectly so that, so that walking can be attained. The arm allows the hand to move to scratch somewhere or to pick something up. It all works together in perfect unison. And God orchestrated every bit of it. We're so adamant on being the only one that knows what we know and the only one that can exist in the circle we create. And those people, if they had their way, would be the only person standing in heaven. But instead, we're supposed to recognize who has the greater ministry. What are you good at? Where are you being led to go? Great, I want you to do that in my ministry. And we join together. And you go through and look in comment sections, you can identify many of the people. Now the big thing we've been having with prophecy is everybody seems to want prophecy. So we're getting a lot of, a lot of people that are making stuff up and lying. It's ruining the gift of prophecy. I say it's better if you have someone else who knows how to teach, someone who's been given a lot of discernment, um, people that have other gifts. You go to them with the prophecy, and then they can discern what's going on with that prophecy instead of you presenting it, and it's a jumbled mess. <coughs> and if you don't have prophecy, don't I don't have prophecy. I'm not going to pretend I have prophecy. Because that doesn't make me better. <laughs> it certainly doesn't make me better. Because if I do it wrong, oof. So what Paul is telling us up here is that if this is what you've been given, that's what you do. Operate within what's in your life. And do it with gusto. Do it as if you're serving God with that gift. That that's what you were given. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to do this for me. Stay right here and do this for me. Yes, Lord. And you do that. Don't go outside of it. Don't get involved in other stuff. Don't try to add to it. Just do that and let the Spirit lead because the Spirit will lead you where God wants you. And it will give you... The people that are street preachers, not all of them do this, but most of them, 
They're uniquely qualified to do that. I couldn't do it. I'd get mad at people. They're uniquely qualified because they can keep control of themselves. But some of the stuff people say doesn't affect them. They're bold to stand up and say, whoa, 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 you know. Now, if the guy called me to do it, you yeah, absolutely I'd be out there doing it. I'd make a bunch of enemies, but the, the word of God always makes enemies. So it is vitally important that we stop looking at what other people have and go, oh, I wish I had that. And I mean, I see people, especially in 2019 and 2020, people all the time commenting saying, they, they I keep praying for tongues and they just won't give it to me. You don't need tongues. Tongues is given to individual people. You don't need tongues. Tongues does not draw you closer to God. Tongues serves a purpose. And unless you're in a specific environment where it's needed, you're just not going to need it. It does no good to anyone. It doesn't help anyone. It doesn't. It, it really only helps the individual if it's if it's between them and the Lord. But even then, if you don't know what you're saying, I mean, it just it doesn't serve much of a purpose. And Paul. And uh, was it First Corinthians, I think, 12, 13, and 14, talks about how the gifts fall in order of importance. Go look at those lists. Read those three chapters and look at those lists. Look at how Paul talks about those. And look at the ones that would be more important to have. We need teachers. You want a gift? Pray to be a teacher. We need prophetic uh, discerners. Pray to have discernment. Pray to be, be have prophecy. Pray to have the things that are going to be able to be a benefit to people. Because right now, tongues serves no purpose unless you're in a ministry in another country. But those other things serve everyone. But instead of lusting or or being jealous of other people or you know, lusting after that's you're going against the commandments. Instead of lusting after somebody else's gift, look at what he's already given you, and that is what you cultivate. I figured out in here, he, he showed me in this ministry, stop forcing it. Just let it happen. Stop forcing it. The prayer I did yesterday, somebody commented and said this, I, I needed to hear this. These words spoke to me. All the other people that watched that prayer video may not have gotten much out of it. That one person needed to get that out of it. God was speaking to that person through that prayer. Not everything that I share on here will have an impact on everybody that watches, but there's one person that needs to hear that message. Because that message is going to speak to them and their situation. That's why I do what I do and just let the Holy Spirit lead. That's why some of these commentaries get weird and go off in weird directions. And sometimes I don't even know where they're going. But then all of a sudden he brings it together. That's why sometimes they're long. That's why sometimes I come out of Psalms and do other scriptures. Because the Holy Spirit is talking to other people. And they need to hear what's being presented. Somebody else goes to another channel and they speak to him through that channel but if each of us operate within the gifts we've been given within the faith we've been given our faith will grow our sanctification leaps forward and we perform that perfect will of God in our lives and it makes God happy because now you're some somebody he can use now you can have an impact you can plant seeds you can water seeds you can help bring brothers and sisters into a stronger faith in showing them that they're not condemned like they think they are or like some, some person has told them they are because they smoked a cigarette or because they had a wine cooler or a beer or something. People condemn everybody for everything. and it's, it's, No, you're not condemned because of those things. I can't memorize scripture, but the Holy Spirit calls it up just like that. To relate to whatever situation we're talking about or what somebody's asking me about. I have had people email me constantly. Many of them about divorce because people are condemning women because they've had a divorce. The ministry I've been given in the, in, that I do through email is to help exhort people and bring them up out of that condemnation. To show them what the Bible really says about these things. And to show them that they're not condemned. Because they've had a divorce or because they had an alcoholic drink or because they ate ham or some other weird, silly thing that people come up with. If God didn't condemn you, you're not condemned. And no one else out there is your judge. 
but we need more people that are willing to walk in those things they've been given and stay there and let that grow stronger because that is what people out there need is the gift you've been given. I've met people that have a beautiful singing ministry and I've told them, this is your, this is your ministry. It's your singing ministry. Sing the Psalms. That's your ministry. They're like, well, that's not as much of a ministry. That's not as good as anybody else's. Oh, no. Your, your gift is better than some people's. But that's what you've been given. Stay in that. And, well, a couple of them didn't. A couple of them decided there was other things they needed to do. And they get caught up in corruption and deception. See, when we try to go outside what we've been given, we end up getting into weird stuff. And it can cause us to turn away from the Lord and ignore him. Stay where he put you. Look at it and go, okay, what's the will of God here? What should I be doing here? Should I be making changes? My wife desperately wants to move to Missouri, and I'm not getting that push. So I told her, let's stay here and fix up what we're going to fix up. She keeps looking at houses up there. The timing's wrong. Let's keep doing what we're doing, because we're doing the right thing now. We're, getting, we're almost completely out of debt. We got money in the bank. I mean, and, and we're below poverty level. The Lord is blessing us richly. Stay where you are. Do what you can do. And what you, within what you've been given. And you will become one of the most incredible vessels of honor in God's temple. That is how you are being molded. Because he takes that rough hewn stone. He takes that center. I did videos on this. The scriptures talk about it. And he carves them the way he wants them. And then he fits you in where your spot is in the temple. Because we're all part of the holy temple of God. He fits you in where you fit in. And that's where you fit in. I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. Because what does the Bible refer to Jesus as? The living stone. The cornerstone. Where's the cornerstone? At the very bottom of the building. Holding it all up. The building does not get built until the cornerstone is set. Because every measurement comes off that cornerstone. Everything that it concerns that building. And it's how it goes up. How high it goes. How big it gets. All comes off that cornerstone. Now take that analogy. And look at your life. Where do I fit in in that building. In that holy temple of God. Where do I fit in? And that's where you go in. You may be surrounding a window, making a window look beautiful. Vision, prophecy, discernment, looking into the, into the scriptures. You may be holding up a corner support beam, exhortation, giving thanks, strengthening people, building up faiths, counseling. You may be one of the harps, singing ministry, music ministry. See how it all comes together? You may be one of the cups. You may be a cup of gold, full of the Spirit, full of faith, full of strength, able to help others, able to be leaned on by others. That'll be the chairs. Every part is an analogy of every one of us. Every gift we have falls into place within that holy temple. And all of it is described in the scriptures. So your part may not be as flashy as someone else's. Your part may not get as much attention, but your part is probably more important than theirs. Because your part may be actually part of holding the building up. Holding up a wall. Being there to support someone who's sitting. You never know where your place is going to be. But if you're constantly trying to get into somebody else's place, can't put two chairs in the same spot. doesn't work. Can't put two cups in the same spot. You might be a candle or a candlestick. The light, strong light for other people to see. Every one of us plays a part. Every bit of what is described in the Bible about that temple is a representation of each of us and the part we play. That building 
was built on the foundation of Jesus Christ as the cornerstone and the twelve apostles around him. Go look at those twelve apostles and look at the different gifts that they had. Look at what made them unique. And then look at your life and see where you might fit in. Go to God in prayer. What, what do you want me to do? And he will show you. And then you will fulfill the will of God in your life. And then your faith will grow strong. And there are, let me, let me disclaimer. There are people who are going to look at what you do. And they're not going to accept it. They're going to laugh at you. I see things sometimes from a very, very different perspective of other people. Sometimes the things that I see, nobody sees it. I can't see that. And I'll literally be reading the scripture describing it. I can't see that. That's not prophecy. That's just having a, a viewpoint that's been opened up by God. And when I see those things, I can prove it in the scriptures. But I'm not, I'm not trying to force on anybody but I know a lot of people can't see those things. So there's a reason why they can't see them. I cannot begin to tell you how many times I was made fun of over the last two and a half years about thinking Jared Kushner could be probably the best candidate for an Antichrist. Some people saw it. Many of them turned and went back to something else. People that never even kind of came close to fitting the bill. How amazing that we have a report come up He started an institute to further the Abraham Accords. If he's not the Antichrist, he sure is somebody helping him. He's playing a big role in it because he's doing all the right things. There's a reason why that guy stands out. The part he plays is important. And I can go into a whole series of things the scriptures describe. People think I'm crazy, but you know what? It's okay. I'm not trying to be famous. I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be well-known. I don't want the attention. Heaven forbid I ever get in a situation where I have to save somebody's life and the city wants to give me an award. No, no, thank you. Not interested. Just say something nice. Tell them I want to be anonymous and I don't even want to talk to nobody. <laughs> I just want to go home because I don't want to get... I, I see what people do when that happens. They will bombard your house. No. Not interested. I like my quiet life. But I know through prayer and through reading the Bible that God has done something. And he's given me certain things. And I want to share them with the people around me. This platform is perfect because I don't want attention. This platform is perfect. Because it gets the, the, the content, the attention. That's just, I'm giving you my, my perspective. I'm giving you what my experience has been. This is definitely not about me. But this may help you understand where your place is. This may help you understand what God is doing in your life. Right now, some of you watching this are questioning where he's leading you because there are things that you see that you don't understand. And you need somebody who is able to put this stuff into real life terms. Share. Somebody who's not ashamed to share their experiences. Because that may help you understand what you're going through. God is going to speak to you through this. You need to hear somebody speak clearly on these things and openly on these things. Because most people won't. Most people are afraid to be candid. I'm not. I lost my modesty in the army. Because if somebody isn't open and candid about what's going on, other people are still, they're, they're going to get right to the point of understanding and then it's going to fall away because somebody needs to go across the line with them. That's what I'm here for. That's part of my ministry. Because there are people that come here and get amazing revelations through what I say because it shows them something in their life they didn't understand. And God is helping them understand. Again, that doesn't make me special. It just means I'm the conduit. Just like so many other people out there are the conduit to help other people with these things. I know this because he showed it to me. I don't want any credit for it. I don't care about any credit for it. What I care about is that the Lord gets magnified. That my brothers and sisters can come to the same place I am and even go past 
where they have that peace in their lives, where they don't worry about the things every day, where they trust that God is doing something in their life and is going to continue to do it and that they are important to him. And so many other things I could list. Paul speaks on this very thing. Where you were saved, that's where you stay. Go to the Lord. Recognize what he's doing with you. Do that perfect will. Once you identify it, do that perfect will. And glorify God every day in it. Because that makes you a part of the temple. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. <coughs> to lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name, to worship you, and to give thanks for everything you do for us. Opening your word up like this, making it relatable in real life terms when so many out there don't or can't. Helping us understand what your will is for our individual lives and what part we play in the holy temple. How would we become a vessel of honor you carve us and mold us to fit in our spot that you made for us. And we see the examples in your word when you talk about Jesus being the cornerstone. You talk about the apostles making the foundation and all of it being built up on top of that. That's why I give thanks for the apostles. I give thanks for the prophets. Those are the people who built all this up and got this prepared. That In the Old Testament, they prepared away. In the New Testament, they built the foundation of the temple. It helps us build off of that. Their experiences, what they went through, what they did, how their lives were measured, all of that. And the interactions they had with you, all of that I give thanks for because that shows us our lives and what we're to do in a world where we don't have that. In a world where the, the rarest animal on the planet is not a platypus or a cheetah or some animal, some blue rhino somewhere. There's only one left. The rarest animal is the person who will openly profess what your word says and tell what your will is by your word. The person that will go in and share conviction with people, not to hurt them, but to bring them further into the truth, to show them what your will is in their life. And we hardly have anybody that does that. And I, I see it sometimes in, the, in my ministry, but Lord, I thank you for using us in these ways helping us help others, showing us in our own lives the things that attain to other people's lives, and then giving us the ability to share that so it helps them understand. This guy knows what I'm talking about. He went through it too. I can go to him and talk to him. I can relate to him. Because when I was getting therapy, and they were sending me to officers, captains, lieutenants who had never been to combat. And I told them, you can't possibly know what I went through because you haven't been over there. You don't know what it's like to have your life set before you. You know what it's like to see the things like that. And the one admitted it. You're right, I don't. <laughs> I have no clue. And I think I'm the wrong person to be talking to you. But when we find someone who can relate to us, it changes everything. We are able to better see what you are doing in our lives and what you want for us. We are better able to see where our place is because someone can present it to us in a way we understand. And you're using every one of us for that. Thank you, Father. And of course, before anything, we have to thank you for this word. This word is written representation of our Lord to teach us these things. But we got to read it. We have, we have to be in it. And the supernatural change that comes over us is just shocking. And it, the clarity, the clarity is amazing. Father, thank you for giving us an advocate in our Lord Jesus Christ. That he was uniquely placed in a position to uniquely understand each one of us and what we are going through in our individual lives. By that, you now understand exactly what we're going through. You know where the perfect place is for us. You know the perfect situation to put us in. You know where we will be the most effective and that is where you use us. Father, help us to stop trying to attain something that's not ours. <coughs> Father, 
Help us to stop trying to, to strive for something that was never given to us. Because I see it leads to deception. It leads to lies. It leads to all kinds of horrible things. Instead, help us to find where our place is, what our gifts are, and to go according to your will to work within that realm. Because that is where we are the most effective. That's where we make the most change and help the most people. Help us to do that. And to do it to the fullest. To glorify you. Because it is only in that that we are able to glorify you. In a gift that's not ours, we can't glorify you. But in a gift that is ours, that is where we glorify you. And it's, we're not going to be famous. We're not going to be well known. Some people may never even know who we are. But you know exactly who we are. That elderly, elderly lady that has played the organ since she was 15 in the church and is in her late 80s, early 90s, at the end of her life, and no one, hardly anyone that passes through that church ever knows what her name is, but she plays the organ beautifully. Almost no one knows who she is. Nobody pays attention to her. She does what she's doing. That's her ministry because that's what she's good at. And then she passes. And they say a few words and they forget about her. But you don't forget about her. Because you welcome her into heaven with fanfare. Because she did her ministry. That what you gave her. She operated within what you gave her. And it is glorious. To witness. It is amazing to see. Father, help us do the same. Help us not worry about being famous. Not worry about having something somebody else doesn't have. I see a lot of channels. People start channels because they feel like they're being led to it. They want, they want the popularity. They want to share the truth. But they realize just how hard it is to do this and how what kind of person you have to be. Through the, seeing that, I realize why you put me through what you put me through. To prepare me to do this. To be stiff-necked and hard-headed. To, to draw a line in the sand and not go beyond it. Because in this kind of type of thing, you have to do that. To not let the enemy depress me and get me down and cause me to stop. You need people that are going to stand up in that truth. It's not for the faint-hearted. So many people should not be doing this. Because it's hard. And a lot of those channels have shut down because of it. Not all of us are called to certain gifts, but to the gift we are called to, if we could ever learn to look past what we agree and disagree on, to look past the physical attributes of each individual person, and to look for the gift you gave that person, and we come together in that fashion, not according to faith, not because this person has a certain faith and that person has a certain faith and they should band with certain groups, but according to how you put us together and according to how the, the amazing gifts you give each one, what a powerhouse of praise and worship that would be. When you can find that unique group of people, the singer, the music player, the exhortationist, the prayer warrior, the teacher, the scripture reading, the person who articulates, the person who can put the emotion behind the text and really give it power. What a ministry. Every now and then you give that to me here. But what a ministry. Bring those people together. Bring all of those with the gifts together. The, the prophecy, the, the discernment, the tongues, everyone. Bring them all together. The interpreter of the tongues. We've got to have him. Bring them all together. And what a powerful, powerful body of Christ you have. But Satan is doing a pretty good job of separating us. Father, we ask that you rebuke Satan. So that we may come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So that we may share our gifts with each other. So that all of us grow in worship and in glory of you. Grow in thanksgiving of you. Grow in faith. Grow in believing in our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in becoming that church, that bride that he is looking for. The spotless bride. That we fulfill your will in our lives. And we give thanks now for that, because we know it's already happening, sanctification. But I also ask that the world gets to see. The world will get a taste. The world will get a view of that light. Because pretty soon we know that light's not going to be here. 
Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on this world. We know there's a time coming for wrath, but now we know we can pray for mercy. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on the people of this world. Let them see that beautiful light at least one more time. So maybe some people will wake up. We hope they will. No matter what, we pray your will is done, Lord. In our lives, in our world, in our families, in everything around us, we pray that your will is done always because your will is perfect. Like Paul says in the very first chapter, holy, acceptable, uh, no, sorry, verse 2, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Lord, renew our minds. Renew our understanding. Renew our, the strength of our faith. Renew us in you and in what you want for us. Renew us in our Lord Jesus so that he can lead us through these things. Renew us in worship. Renew us in giving thanks. Renew us in glorifying you in all things. That we will remember to give glory to you in everything that happens. Because all good things come from you. And all the bad things are used by you to make us better. We should give glory to you for all of them. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for this time, this day, that another day to come together and to glorify. Another day to help each other and lift each other up. My goal, my desire in this ministry is to help as many people as possible come to a closer faith with you and come to a greater understanding of what your will is in their lives by helping open up the scriptures as much as you give me, by helping people, by making it relatable, by using myself as an example and how it obtains to real life. And many have been helped. And I thank you for that. Please keep doing what you're doing in our lives. Father, we cannot give thanks enough for that. We cannot glorify you enough for that. We cannot praise you enough for that. And we pray that your will is served in all things and that you come quickly. That Lord, you send our Lord to come and collect us and get us out of this world. Things are still moving forward. Things are still going downhill. We certainly don't belong here. The world certainly doesn't want us, and that's becoming very evident. But Lord, no matter what, I pray your will is done concerning these things. Make us strong in faith. Make us a light. That your light would emanate from us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who teaches us. We thank you for our Lord Jesus who died for us. We thank you for all those that came before us that built this up. And us building on top. We thank you for molding us. Thank you for the troubles in our lives that have changed us. That have created a different view in us. That have made us more acceptable to you. And made us more usable. We thank you for that carving. That shaping of that rough hewn stone. Making us into something beautiful. That can serve you in heaven. Thank you Father for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for all you do. And in Jesus name we, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me for morning prayer. What has he done in your life? Where has he put you? What has he shown you that is your gift? Now don't don't go crazy and, and go out there and try to change a bunch of people with your gift. Learn about it first. Read in his word and learn and by prayer learn the right way to use it. Use discernment and let the spirit lead. I can't, I can't make you understand what I'm describing but like these videos, I, I was so half asleep when I started this. Let the Holy Spirit will lead you into what to say. Let him lead you. Don't fight him. He may lead you to get out of your car on the side of the highway at an accident when you're in traffic and kneel down at the door and pray over that people. Don't fight that desire. Get out and do it. Because the person in the car behind you or next to you, they may have needed to see that happen. To cause them to start thinking about him. And that may be the beginning of change in their life.
give thanks to God for the wonderful day or for the rain or for the beautiful weather. We're about to have a run of 70 degree temperature in the end of May. That never happens in South Texas. We should already be in the 90s and 100s. Give thanks in a convenience store at the counter. Thank God we've got such wonderful rain. And I got to give him thanks because this is beautiful weather and this kind of stuff only comes from him. Let them hear you. The person behind you may have been looking for that. And that may have been the trigger for them to turn to the Lord. You never know how he's going to use you. It's not forcing our gift on people. It's subtly placing it where it needs to be. And the Holy Spirit will prompt us every time to do that. That person that looks horrible and they're sad and the Holy Spirit prompts you to say, Are you okay? Show them compassion. Let the Holy Spirit lead. I'm speaking from experience because I've done all these things. And it has made a difference. Not only in my life, but in the people that witness these things. And on multiple occasions, I've seen pain on somebody's face. Are you okay? Some wanted to talk, some didn't want to talk. But the ones that did unloaded because there's nobody in their life that will listen to them. And they needed somebody to talk to them. I actually went behind the counter and talked to somebody one time. And they started crying. And I hugged them. I didn't know this person from a hill of beans. They didn't know me from a hill of beans. I told them it's okay. The Lord is doing a work in your life. These things are temporary. They will go away. Lean on him. Go to him. Pray to him. Tell him how you feel. He will help you. He will comfort you. And he will take this pain away. And she looked up and she said, that is exactly what I was, I thought inside somebody would need to say to me. And here you are, a random person telling me this. I'm like, the Lord works that way. I, said, I told her, I didn't know what I was coming here for. Because I've never been in this store. But here we are. And, you know, I never went in that store again. He never put me on that side of town to go to that store again. Never saw that person again. The lady at the uh, Jack in the Box in the middle of town on Court Street. I could tell. You okay? Holy Spirit, it was a strong feeling in my heart. Are you okay? I told her, and she, she, she denied it and then started to walk away. I said, I can tell you're hurting. And it probably involves a child. And she stopped in her tracks and spun around, walked over, and she said, how did you know that? I said, sometimes you just know. The, the Lord does those things. He, he puts those things on people's hearts. And she starts telling me. And I, I had paid for the food I was getting with a 20. I said, I got another $20 bill. You can have it. No, no, no. I said, no. Put it in your thing. Don't tell nobody. Just use that to do what you need to do. Because I I don't need it. That's extra. I made that doing something for somebody. You can have it. Because it's not going to do me any good. I'm just going to buy junk food with it anyway. You, you have it. Two weeks later, I went back to that same thing. And that girl was gone. I said, hey, is she here? They said, no. They said, you're the guy that gave her that $20. Yep. I said, dude, you changed her life. What did you say to her? Everything changed for that girl. And it wasn't the $20. It was the fact that somebody took the time to listen. That somebody actually cared. That's what changed her life. And she went on, got a different job, made more money, got an apartment because they weren't living anywhere on their own. They were living with other people. Got her daughter what she needed for school. And as far as I know, their life was doing great. Hopefully she got saved and became a Christian. You never know how he's going to use you. But if you never read the Bible, and if you never open yourself up to his will and to the Holy Spirit, if you never work within the realm of your gifts, you will never know. And I tell you these things because that's what I did. And it opened the world completely up. And it changed everything. And now when I'm around, I look for people. And the Holy Spirit will put stuff on you. It's not psychic. It's not psychic talent. The Holy Spirit will put stuff on you. This is why they're upset. And you mention that and watch the shock come over their face. And that's your opportunity to help them. That's your opportunity to share the Lord with them. Because that person needed to hear that from you. 
There are people out there who don't trust a, ma a man with a beard because they have a, a, a different understanding about that. They have some kind of internal schism about men with beards. So when I always had a clean shaven face, I could talk to people. Now it's flipped. I have a beard. And the people I run into are people that trust a man with a beard. God knows what he's doing. God works in such mysterious and awesome ways. And we never know it because we never read his word and learn about those things. We never go to him in prayer and talk to him about those things and ask him. We never open our eyes and look because we're so busy, focused on things that are completely inconsequential. Take that time today to look a little closer, to pray and then show me what your will is for me. And then don't worry about it after that. Let him work in your life. When you get those promptings, those, those, that, that stick in your heart or that pain that grabs your heart, pay attention to it. Because it may be that when you act on that, it changes something. That may be a divine appointment. Because that's how God works. It's, it's amazing and it's wonderful. And all of you who have gone through this, who know this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You just never know. I love you guys. I bless you all. In Jesus' name, I pray you have a fantastic day. And I'll see you guys in the next video.